Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, this morning, it's really my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Linehan, who comes to us from University of Rochester Medical Center, where he's professor and uh, chair of surgery. Uh, he holds the Seymour I. Schwartz uh, professorship there, and he uh, is very well trained. He had his MD from University of Massachusetts Medical School. After that, he did his internship as well as his residency at Beth Israel Deaconess, spent a lot of time in Boston over the years. Uh, following that, he did his fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, and a surgery fellowship at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And then following that, he uh, went to Memorial Sloan Kettering where he did additional fellowship in surgical oncology. So prior to his uh, move to Rochester a few years ago, he had been at Washington University in St. Louis for a number of years where he had a very productive academic career. And uh, Dr. Linehan is one of these very special people who both excels clinically um, and is recognized for outstanding patient care in the area of surgical oncology, as well as running a very active uh, research program and has a laboratory on top of it that is very translational in nature. And uh, our, our laboratory has followed his work for quite a few years, and we really view him as a thought leader in the field, merging uh, true translational research in immunotherapy and applying it to a very tough disease of pancreatic cancer. His group has really uh, been the driving force behind understanding CCR2, uh, CCL2 interactions in pancreatic cancer and understanding how the tumor-associated macrophages really shut off anything immunologically that you come in and try to throw at these tumors. So it's really our pleasure to have him here at Winship today and uh, very much look forward to his talk. So thank you. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Greg, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's actually my first visit to Emory, believe it or not, um, and so I'm really uh, glad to have uh, come and, and share our work. I, I, you know, I walked into this room this morning, I looked at the back, and there's this great quote on the back wall, the future always belongs to the discontented. And there's probably nobody more discontent than a pancreatic surgeon who puts a patient through a big operation, um, with, which has a lot of potential complications and, and uh, morbidity associated with it, and then you see the patient back six months later and do a CT scan, and they've got, you know, 10 liver metastases. So uh, the work that we're in uh, keeps us discontented and keeps us motivated, and as a surgeon, I came to the conclusion a long time ago that the solution to pancreatic cancer is not surgery. We need better novel therapies, and, and so that's what we've been trying to do over uh, the last several years. Is this uh, supposed to... Uh, just click that to get rid of that and then it'll work. There we go. Okay. All right. So immunotherapy is all over the news. It's, uh, you know, I, probably everyone's looking at uh, Jimmy Carter with his, uh, with his melanoma metastasis of the brain and that was, what, three years ago and he's still advising the president on how to deal with North Korea. Um, the, the, um, uh, and for those of us that have been in this field for a long time, the, the, the enthusiasm really kind of waxed and waned. Um, starting back in the days with, uh, you know, very expensive and cumbersome adoptive uh, T-cell uh, strategies that we used, uh, but now we've really got uh, drugs that work uh, and there's, there's lots of enthusiasm and funding. I, I like this uh, cover from Time Magazine uh, a, few year, a, year, a couple years ago uh, talking about the hugely expensive uh, life-saving trials of immunotherapy, and I think that's something that we need to think about as we're uh, trying to translate our findings in the lab out to the population. You know, it's wonderful that we've got these uh, fantastic uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, and uh, you know, but if you look at the practicality of trying to, um, to translate these therapies uh, out, it becomes m much more difficult. And so we've actually been taking a more simple approach, uh, looking at drugs that we think can, can manipulate the microenvironment that don't involve a lot of cost. Uh, and actually, the drugs that we were used were drugs that had already been developed for other indications, and so it was quite easy to take them to clinical trial. So we understand the, the whoops, what did I do? We understand the biology a little bit more. Um, just point over there. 
um, and uh, you know, based on the T cell that uh, you know, with these drugs now that can block uh, checkpoint inhibitors, there's a lot of enthusiasm for uh, revving up the T cells. But I, I will submit to you that the the field has really been too T cell centric. The T cell is probably the common final pathway in most instances where of the antitumor immune response. Uh, but if you look at pancreas cancer, there's a lot going on in that microenvironment, and we've got to deal with that because you can have the perfect T cell, you can have the perfect vaccine, uh, but it's never going to work uh, in a microenvironment like we see in pancreas cancer, which is, uh, is profoundly immune suppressive. And so it's this balance that we're talking about between stim immune stimulation and immune suppression. Uh, within the tumor, and we've spent a lot of time studying it. It's complex, and there's a lot of cells involved. We've been really focusing on these myeloid cells, uh, which come from the bone marrow uh, to the peripheral blood and into the tumor, where they differentiate into macrophages, and they can either be macrophages that are going to suppress an immune system, the immune system, or ones that could stimulate it. Um, the cytokine environment is important. That's a lot of Greg's work, uh, looking at the IL-6 and stellate cells, and so really. Uh, what we're trying to do is to tip this balance uh, away from immune suppression to allow an adaptive immune response to take place, but it's the innate immune cells in the, in the um, microenvironment that are probably the orchestra conductor here, and we have, to, we have to face that and deal with them. Now, people say, well, you've got to be careful when you do this. You take this dormant immune system and you stimulate it. You know, can you um, cause toxicities, autoimmune toxicities? And that's, you know, it's, it's a concern that we think about, but it's not so much a concern in metastatic pancreas cancer. These patients are willing to take risks, and they're willing to allow us to translate what we find. So this is just an example of taking something dormant and trying to stimulate it. This is my 18-year-old son, um, and this is in um, Chiang Mai in Thailand uh, at Christmas time. And uh, you can see that in Chiang Mai, they don't have any uh, liability attorneys. Um, <laughs> But uh, there could be unintended consequences of exciting the immune system, but the, the, the patient isn't too worried about it, nor is my son who uh, doesn't seem too worried about it. But the strategy that we've taken is this, um, uh, is looking at these macrophages, which really in the tumor microenvironment are M2 or suppressive mac macrophages. And the, the question is, is can you differentiate them, drive their differentiation in the microenvironment to turn them on? That's one strategy. The strategy we've taken is a little different, is, is we're trying to block them and prevent them from ever getting there. And um, so the, um, the, the, what happens really is, is that there's this active conversation going on between the tumor um, and the bone marrow. And, it, and it's analogous, to, as a surgeon, I think of this a lot in terms of wound healing. This is orchestrated. Um, series of events that happens with a surgical wound. The, the platelets come in first to stop the bleeding, the neutrophils come in to stop infection, and then the macrophages ultimately get there and help with remodeling. Well, the, 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 the tumor really kind of tricks the bone marrow uh, into thinking that there's this chronic wound that needs to be healed. So there's this very active influx of cells from the bone marrow uh, to the tumor. And uh, we decided that we could try to block that by preventing these myeloid cells from getting to the tumor microenvironment. This is a typical patient that I see in the clinic, and I think most clinicians would agree that this is not resectable pancreas cancer. It's complete encasement of the superior mesenteric artery, uh, locally advanced disease. There's not, I can't offer an operation to that patient. We'd really like to be able to. Is there a way that we could potentially downsize that to get the patient to resection? But the, the point is, is that the majority of pancreas cancer patients either come in looking like this or they've got metastatic disease at the time of presentation. So surgery is probably not the answer. And we, we started this just really with the simple question, when you look at pancreas cancer under the microscope, this is what it looks like, and sometimes, you know, 10% of the cells in the tumor are cancer cells and 90% are other cells. And so we just asked a very simple question, what are these cells, why are they here, and is this one of the reasons why this is such a virulent malignancy with no effective treatments? Um, and so it was it's just really that simple question that we asked ourselves dec over a decade ago. And when you actually look at this, you know, pancreas cancer does have this dense stroma. It's mostly stromal cells, not tumor cells. Um, and when you start to um, catalog them, uh, what do you see? That the abundance of cells are actually myeloid cells, these red or monocytes and green or granulocytes. So the abundance of infiltrating immune cells in the pancreas cancer microenvironment uh, are bone marrow derived myeloid cells, unlike other tumors where the T cells are more uh, common infiltrate. And you can see, I don't know if I can get rid of that. If you see down here, uh, here's the T cells. So T cells are relatively rare in the microenvironment. It's the myeloid cells that, that predominate. 
So that we kind of found interesting. So we, we did a lot. We looked in human tissue. We could see that the, the prevalence of myeloid cells in the tumor uh, in, in surgically resected diseases had uh, prognostic significance. And it led us to believe that these cells were important. And so we developed this, this uh, strategy to block them using a chemokine receptor inhibitor, uh, which really was working. The mechanism of this drug was working at the level of the bone marrow, preventing the mobilization. So the tumor sending a message to the bone marrow to mobilize these cells, and we blocked it. And we did this study in locally advanced disease. And we published this in, uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the trial, but we published this in Lancet Oncology um, a little over a year ago and showed it, when you use a CCR2 inhibitor with, um, with systemic chemotherapy, we saw about a 50% response rate with, uh, uh, in patients with locally advanced disease, which was far greater than what would be anticipated from fulfirinoxalan, really probably doubling uh, response rate. And we could see, and when we did this trial, we collected both baseline and on-treatment uh, fine needle aspiration biopsies um, so that we could go back and look at the human tissue and do correlative studies to see, um, first of all, if we were hitting the target, and then second of all, if we could correlate any of that with outcome. And you can see that when you do this, um, you prevent these tumor-associated macrophages from coming to the tumor microenvironment. This is a baseline and on treatment uh, from this cohort of patients. And um, this is uh, some of the, uh, tri the, the correlative studies that we did with the human tissue. We could compare baseline to post-treatment, and you can see that um, CD8 cells went up, CD4 cells went up, and regulatory T cells went down, suggesting that we were kind of reprogramming the tumor microenvironment by depleting these tumor associated macrophages. So by dealing with those, adapt those innate immune cells, we could actually provide reasonably good evidence that we were allowing an adaptive immune response uh, to take hold. So um, the other thing is, is that when we went back and we looked at the patients that responded and those that didn't, and I told you it was a 50% uh, partial response rate, it correlated highly with the prevalence of these CCR2 positive uh, inflammatory monocytes in the peripheral blood. So the, the nomenclature is a little important here. If they're in the peripheral blood, I call them inflammatory monocytes. If they're in the tumor, I call them tumor-associated macrophages. Same cell, just depends on where it is. But in the, uh, in the peripheral blood, you can see that if you responded, um, you were much like, more likely to have very low levels of CCR2 positive uh, inflammatory monocytes in your peripheral blood, suggesting again that if you're hitting the target and you hit it well, it correlated with response. So another, in, in, you know, part of what I'll say is, is that these biopsies are so important because if you look at, you know, if you look at the standard therapies for pancreas cancer, look at fulfirinox, it's a three drug regimen, it's pretty toxic. And the response rates are 30%, right? So 70% get no benefit. At the end of the day, we can't tell the patient why uh, unless we do these trials and we collect baseline and on-treatment biopsies to really uh, to sort some of this out. So, so with this, with, when we did this study with these fine needle aspirations, we did a lot with those, those, those specimens. They were quite precious, baseline and on-treatment. We did, um, and we did, um, RNA-seq, um, and then shared the raw genomic data with Jen Jen Ye, who's a pancreas surgeon at UNC uh, and one of our key collaborators. And she's developed uh, a system where she can basically uh, subtype, molecularly subtype uh, pancreas cancers. And you're probably, the pancreas cancer people in the room are probably from, quite familiar with her work. But basically, uh, she, she looks at the, um, the um, percentage of stroma within the tumor, are they, is it uh, more like this, which is more common, this is less stroma, and through very sophisticated mathematical modeling, uh, she can look at gene signatures, and basically the, the concept behind this is it's really a virtual microdissection. She can tell you the signals that are coming from the stroma versus those that are coming from the tumor, and then classify them into either activated stroma uh, or, or normal stroma. Um, into these subtypes. And then you can look at the tumor signals and, and uh, basically classify those into basal or classical. So it's a pretty straightforward system. There's really four categories. On the tumor side, it's basal versus classical. On the stroma side, it's activated versus normal. And then there's, um, there's uh, prognostic significance to that. And you can see here in the, the uh, activated stroma does worse than the normal stroma uh, when you look at surgically resected patients. Now, what we had in this trial is because we had baseline and non-treatment biopsies, we could go back and use this genetic algorithm and, and look and see if these things uh, uh, predicted outcome. And you can see there was only three patients that had basal, but basal, we saw no responses in basals. All the responses were in uh, the classical 
tumors when you're looking at the tumor gene signature. And then um, when you looked at the, the stroma, um, the question is, did the stroma switch from activated to normal or from normal to activated? The genetic signature of the tumor virtually never switches. It switched once from classical to basal. But you can see from the stroma, we're seeing this switching where it's going from activated to normal or from normal to activated. And you can see that that actually has prognostic significance. So this genomic signature told us that if, we were, if, the, if the stroma was changing, that uh, uh, those patients did poorly. And the ones um, that did the best had normal stroma that stayed normal. So uh, just kind of another way to look at it is, is that, uh, and so we, we did uh, a lot of, um, um, uh, cyt we, we did a flow cytometry, we look at the cellular infiltrate, we did genetic uh, analysis of this, and now in the next iterations of the trial, we're getting a little more sophisticated with things like mass cytometry and cytop, where we can really uh, look at phenotype and function of the cells, but also this genomic signature as well. So the idea being is, is that you take these specimens, they're very precious, and you do as much as you possibly can with them to try to learn uh, if, uh, there's prognostic significance, and, and I think the end goal of that is I think we can likely, um, at, in, in a one-month biopsy, really ask the simple question, are we taking an immunologically cold tumor and turning it to hot? And if you are, then it's probably worth pursuing that if you can correlate that to, to ultimate response. And so this early on treatment signal, um, I think, will be important in terms of how we tailor therapies to patients. So. So the, this, this first trial that we did, basically, no, no problems with toxicities. And we did, you know, this is fulfirinox plus adding something. So there was a little consternation about, about doing that, but it, uh, it wasn't a, a problem. Uh, we got a 50% response rate, which is double what you'd expect. Um, we showed that we hit the target, and these, um, mod, the, the, the TAMs never made it to the tumor microenvironment. And the idea is, is that this should be further explored. So, uh, and this was in locally advanced disease. So the next question, obviously, is, well, since more than half the patients present with metastatic disease, this is work in the metastatic setting, so we designed two metastatic trials. This is two different companies, um, both with CCR2 inhibitors. This is a company called Chemocentrix, uh, and we did a trial with, with them, basically, with the Fulfirinox backbone um, in metastatic disease. Um, we're just, we just reported this at the asco SITSI meeting with a um, 18 month overall survival in the metastatic setting of 30%, so that looks promising because in the uh, historical data it should be uh, about 18%. Um, and, then, and then we also, with the Pfizer compound, which was the one in the original trial in, in local advanced disease, uh, we also did a um, metastatic trial, but the, we switched the chemotherapy backbone to um, gemabraxane um, and did this. Uh, this study. So we took uh, two different CCR2 inhibitors and took them to the metastatic setting with different chemotherapy backbones. And again, uh, we did uh, a lot of correlative studies, and this is just peripheral blood looking at uh, phospho-ERK showing that with the CCR2 inhibitor, um, and this is in the Pfizer metastatic trial with the gemabraxane backbone, um, we, were, we were hitting the target. Um, and again, looking at some um, representative flow cytometry from the patients, um, you can see that we isolated CD45 cells, and, and this is basically from the tumor biopsies, looking at baseline and on study, and you can see these are the CCR2 positive tumor associated macrophages baseline and on treatment, so we, we were pretty confident that we were hitting the target hard in these tumor, these cells were not making it to the tumor. This is just the patients from this trial that we treated in Rochester, where we, we, this trial was opened in several sites in Europe, and in, the, in both WashU and um, Rochester in, um, in the United States. And so these are the patients in Rochester that we had fresh tissue baseline and on study, and we started to look um, for the changes in the cellular infiltrate. And you can see with the CCR2 inhibitor in the tumor, the TAMs go down. This is just a representative plot of that, looking um, at the, uh, the tumor infiltrating. Um, lymphocytes baseline and on study, you can see that the T cells are going up, both CD4s and CD8s, and the CD4s that are going up are not regulatory T cells. So again, evidence that we're reprogramming the tumor microenvironment, allowing an adaptive immune response to occur. So this just kind of summarizes that um, CD8s go up, CD4s go up, and uh, FOXP3s, the CD4s are not uh, suppressor cells. And then um, we also uh, asked the question, well, with these T cells, do we have an increase in uh, checkpoint inhibitors? And in fact, you do. And it kind of makes physiologic sense when you're turning on an adaptive, uh, robust immune response, and the brakes are going to come on uh, ultimately. 
And um, we could see that when you compared the, the baseline and on study, that there was an increase in PD-1 on the CD4 T cells. And, and so that's the rationale for coupling this with checkpoint inhibitors. And I think uh, one of my key collaborators, David DiNardo, was here talking about the studies that we're doing combining uh, myeloid depletion with checkpoint inhibition uh, as part of the um, SPORE uh, grant that we, sh that we share a project on. So, um, but the PD-1, um, and this is just in the handful of patients that we treated in, um, in, in Rochester on the, the second metastatic uh, Pfizer trial, is, is that it wasn't consistent. We saw some go up and some go down, and it's going to be interesting to take that and then and correlate it with response ultimately to see if the PD-1 upregulation is a mechanism of treatment resistance, which it would be relatively straightforward to hypothesize that it is. This is the, the waterfall plot with the metastatic trial, the follow-up one with the gemabraxane, and you can see it was pretty similar, is that there was a, a, about a 40% response rate in metastatic disease, better than you'd expect with uh, gemabraxane alone. And then this is the treatment response over time, um, and you can see uh, this is the percent baseline, and there are many patients with durable partial responses uh, um, in the cohort from the, um, from the gemabraxane trial. Um, and here's the, um, the patients. We did a little bit of a dose uh, escalation um, up to 750, <coughs> but then went back actually to the, uh, we started uh, at 500, uh, had some dose limiting toxicity at 750, so went back to this, the original dose which we had used in the, the local advanced trial. Um, and uh, the endpoint was looking at 23 weeks um, um, uh, progression-free survival at 23, 23 weeks. So uh, probably not as, uh, the, with the gemabraxane, it wasn't, the results weren't as good as with the fulfirinox, although you can't really compare it because one was purely metastatic and other was locally uh, advanced disease, but um, evidence or response. So, so the conclusion of this trial is, is that this, uh, the, um, the, the, the changing to the, the backbone to uh, gemabraxane, uh, we were able to show uh, uh, acceptable safety profile, um, and we didn't have to dose reduce the gemabraxane when adding the CCR2 inhibitor. We showed from the coralist ice in the tissue that we hit the target. Uh, we saw a 46 percent uh, PR rate, which is again better than uh, significantly better than you expect with um, gemabraxane alone, and then um, uh, came up with a, the, the optimal dose of 500. And so this is kind of the summer, summary of the trials that we've done with the CCR2 inhibitor uh, over the last several years. You can see the two, the one's the Pfizer compound, this is the chemocentrics compound. You can see this, the first one was, the, the one published in Lancet Oncology was in locally advanced, then the metastatic. This did include a few locally advanced patients, um, but 90% but, um, of these patients had metastatic disease. And this again was with the gemabraxane backbone, and you can see we're getting consistent PR rates that are pretty high, and we're seeing 18-month overall survival uh, in these patients that is, uh, that is higher than would be predicted based on historical controls. So, and so that was really just, I showed you at the beginning that we, um, we um, hit the, the myeloid cells, but the, the um, I'm sorry, the monocytes, the, the tumor-associated macrophages in the microenvironment, but I showed you in the beginning slide that the, the predominant infiltrated myeloid cells, but more than half of those are actually neutrophils or granulocytes, and we were just kind of hitting the monocytes. And so the question was, is, um, is it, uh, does it make more sense? Because we know that those tumor-associated neutrophils can be profoundly immune suppressive as well, and would dual blockade and really knocking out the whole myeloid population be better than just focusing on the, the TAM? So getting the, the tumor-associated neutrophils and macrophages. And so we went back to our mouse model uh, and did a lot of work with that, and this was just published. It's actually not in press anymore. I need to update this slide. It was published a, um, a, month or, a couple months ago in, in gut. Um, so um, one of the things that we noted from the human trial is, is that when we did CCR2 inhibition, we saw this compensatory increase in CXCR2 positive um, granulocytes in the tumor. And this is just showing that that's baseline. And after CCR2 inhibition, you've got a, a compensatory increase in the neutrophils. And so you're hitting one uh, myeloid cell, but getting a compensatory increase in the other. And we know that the, 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 the CXCR2, which go on to be the tumor-associated neutrophils, are immune suppressive as well. And so is this a potential mechanism of treatment resistance? So again, this is what I just kind of said, is when you look at the, the, the cellular infiltrate, the, these are the granulocytes and these are the monocytes. So the granulocytes are actually even more prevalent than the monocytes. So um, the, and, and we had a good target here because the chemokine, again, the chemokine receptor 
uh, ligand interaction, CCR2 for the monocytes, CXCR2 uh, and its ligands for the neutrophils. And we've got a good drug, the, com the, uh, the company Chemocentrics that we worked with that had a CCR2 inhibitor also has a CXCR2 inhibitor that's um, nearly ready for human trial. So <clears throat> the circulating neutrophils in the peripheral blood and, and uh, pancreas cancer patients have been shown to be prognos prognostic. And actually, you can look at this in multiple different cancer types. The neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio predicts outcome. And if you look, um, you can see in the peripheral blood comparing a pancreas cancer patient to an age match control, there's a, there's a marked increase in these um, CXCR2 positive uh, granulocytic MDSC in the peripheral blood uh, of pancreas cancer patients. And, uh, and they correlate inversely with survival. So if you look at this uh, prevalence of CXCR2 positive neutrophils um, in uh, survival, there's a positive correlation with survival. Um, and again, in, when compared to age match controls, they're more prevalent in the peripheral blood and their prevalence does correlate with outcome. And then again, you can look at that was peripheral blood and you can look in the bone marrow and find the same thing that the, um, their increase in pancreas cancer patients and their prevalence um, is correlated with survival. And then the, you know, we had shown in the monocyte story that it was a pretty clean story. There was the cancer cells themselves that were expressing CCL2, the ligand, uh, drawing these, these cells, mobilizing from the bone marrow and ultimately into the tumor microenvironment. And the tumor cells themselves also express these CX uh, ligands, the ligands for CXCR2. And there's multiple ligands, but you can see when you compare age match controls to cancer, uh, it's the cancer cells themselves. And we've been able to show this with uh, immunistic chemistry that the cancer cells, the are expressing all of the ligands for CXCR2 as well. So, um, so the cancer is calling both the myeloid cells and the granulocytes to the tumor microenvironment. This is just showing some of that immunistic chemistry. And this is looking at all of the different CXCR2 ligands that are going to draw neutrophils in CXCR1, 2, 5, and 8. And you can see it's actually the, the cancer cells themselves that are expressing these ligands. So, um, if, you, if you compare, uh, and this is uh, looking at um, the tumors, so looking in tumors and you can see that uh, comparing a, a adjacent normal uh, pancreas to uh, pancreas adenocarcinoma, the prevalence of these, and in humans they're CD15, CD11B, uh, so these are granulocytes and you can see that they're, um, they're not really present in normal pancreas, but they're abundant in uh, in the tumors. Um, see, we look just at CXCL2, CXCL5, uh, again, in the tumor, um, and there's, there's positive correlation with, um, with uh, the presence of TAN. So, you know, if the ligands express, the, the neutrophils get, get to the tumor. And then we looked at this in terms from our uh, tissue microarrays that we had from resected patients. So, uh, looking at the uh, prognosis of resected patients, and we could show that the ratio of CXCL5 and tumor-associated neutrophils uh, to infiltrating CD8 cells is prognostic in pancreas cancer. So if you've got very high levels of that, lots of these tumor-associated neutrophils in the tumor uh, and no T cells, those patients do poorly, uh, whereas the opposite, they do better if the opposite is true. So again, when we had shown the same thing with the, uh, with the uh, monocytes as well, that they were highly uh, prognostic in resected patients. So we went back to, we, we did all this work on the human tissue showing this correlation with prognosis and then go back to our mouse model. This is kind of our workhorse uh, mouse model with orthopic implantation of KPC uh, with bioluminescence imaging and we can kind of uh, follow both primary tumors and metastasis with this. And so uh, we've got all of these chemokine receptor inhibitors that we can use. Um, to test to see if, uh, if dual blockade was better than um, blockade of either alone in our preclinical model. Um, we saw the same thing in, that we saw in the human tumors with the mouse KPC, that all of these ligands for the um, CXCR2 positive uh, uh, granulocytic MDSC were expressed on the, um, the mouse tumors as well. So it completely recapitulates what we see in the human tumors, similar to uh, what we saw uh, in uh, KPC mice with the, the ligands for CCR2. 
So it's nice when the, the mouse model recapitulates the human disease and it looks like what we see in the human tissue. And, and you can see that um, it, when you look in the, the blood uh, and the bone marrow that you've got an increase uh, in these um, CXCR2 uh, positive cells and then you can inhibit them with the CXCR2 uh, inhibitor, the drug. So if you look in, this is CXCR2 positive neutrophils in the peripheral blood um, and and you can see that um, the CXCR2 positive neutrophils in the bone marrow as well, when you block them with CC, you can block them with the CCR2, uh, CXCR2 inhibitor uh, in our mouse studies. And this is just showing what the TANs look like in the mouse tumors. And when you use the CXCR2 inhibitor, they, they disappear. Um, so again, showing we can hit the target and deplete the tumors of these uh, neutrophils in, the, in our mouse model. And then the, there was an anti-tumor response, the, it was looking at the tumor volumes and then in the bioluminescence imaging, we could show with, C, with the CXCR2 inhibitor alone, um, there was an anti-tumor immune response. And you could do the same thing by, by just inhibiting the granule sites with uh, Li6G. So um, we've, we had shown that when you block CCR2, again, that you get this compensatory increase in the CXCR2 positive TANs. And this is just with the, we have a, uh, uh, with the KCKO model with orthotopic tumors that are treated with CCR2 inhibition. Again, like we saw from the human specimens that there's a compensatory increase in the TANs. When you block the, when you, when you block the TAMs, you get an increase in the TANs. So again, um, suggesting that this dual blockade strategy uh, might be helpful if we really wanted to reprogram the tumor microenvironment. And we did this both in the, in the context of chemotherapy in our orthotopic model and uh, no chemotherapy and chemotherapy. And this is CCR2 inhibition, CXCR2 inhibition, and then dual inhibition. And you can see when you use dual inhibition, um, you, you hit the TANs. So this is looking in the tumors, the TANs are gone, either with CXCR2 alone. It doesn't have an effect on the, the TAMs. So, the, the uh, CCR2 inhibition isn't going to affect your, um, your TANs in the microenvironment, but when you, when you treat with the CXCR2, you hit the target. And again, this is looking at TAMs. When you use a CXCR2 inhibitor, you don't affect the TAMs, but you hit the, 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 uh, the TANs. And it's the same thing with, um, with or without chemotherapy. So um, we, we then set out to do this dual inhibition uh, study in preclinical models showing that when you do dual inhibition with or without chemotherapy, that was the best anti-tumor response. It was better than either alone. Um, and we show that in multiple ways, um, looking uh, in multiple models, not as with KCKO as well as KPC, with both with Fulfirinox, we did it with Gemabraxane, and every time you did it, the, um, the dual inhibition was better than either alone in terms of the anti-tumor response. And then if you looked at overall survival, the dual inhibited mice do better. Um, than the um, chemotherapy only or controls. And so, um, and then we asked the question, well, with the dual blockade, do we, do we reprogram the microenvironment? And if you can, and you look at uh, CD8 cells, and this is just fulfirinox well, alone, then the CCR2 inhibitor, both, uh, and then the, the, the biggest um, CD8 infiltrate you, you see is when you do the combination of the complete dual myeloid blockade with chemotherapy. Uh, evidence of more uh, CD8 cells. And then um, CD4 cells, it was the same story, dual blockade. The CD4s go up um, with, um, and, the, and the Tregs go down. So again, evidence that you're getting rid of suppressors and you're turning on an adaptive immune response. But the, so you, all of this stuff that I show, showed you is really just showing the prevalence of these lymphocytes goes up in the tumor microenvironment. But the question is, is are they functional? And what is the quality of these T cells? And so we use the, the NERS 77 um, transgenic mouse, which I'm not sure if any of you have used this, but it's actually a kind of, it's a good way to look at T cells because it's not only tells you prevalence, it also tells you function. Because if you have, sig if you have signaling through the T cell receptor, you, uh, these cells fluoresce and you can quantitate that. And so with the, uh, with the uh, dual inhibition of CCR2 plus CXCR2, uh, we could see a marked increase in signaling through T cell receptors. I don't know what the antigen is, but I know that the T cell receptors are firing. And again, it's good evidence that an adaptive immune response uh, is happening with this dual myeloid inhibition. So um, 
and again, it's, you know, we, the, the, the question is, is are we taking an immunologically cold tumor and making it hot with dual myelin inhibition? And this data suggests uh, that we are, because we tested this with chemotherapy with, this, with all of these strategies. And the, the, the most important one is this chemotherapy with dual inhibition. And you can see you're getting a marked increase in these um, cytokines in the tumor microenvironment that are suggestive of an adaptive immune response. IL-12 is going up. And, you know, the, the, the thing with IL-12, if, the, if there are any macrophages uh, or myelate cells left in the tumor microenvironment, the IL-12 is probably going to drive their differentiation to a favorable M1 phenotype and not an M2 one. So um, again, evidence that we've, we've turned an immunologically cold tumor hot. So, um, so that's all the data I've showed you so far is in pancreas cancer. We've, we also have looked in uh, cholangiocarcinoma, where we have a nice mouse model um, of cholangio. And, um, and human cholangio is characterized by a very similar uh, type immune infiltrate. We've got this nice model. Um, I'm sorry, this is, this is uh, just showing normal liver versus cholangiocarcinoma, the stromal infiltrate, and it's just loaded with these CD45 cells. So it's the same thing where you see this, those, uh, this marked infiltration with immune cells. Um, we've got this nice uh, spontaneous model of cholangiocarcinoma with, with an albumin Cre. Uh, uh, transgenic models. It's similar to the KPC mouse, but it's uh, turned on in the liver with al albumin Cre recombinase. And then we give uh, a drug that causes kind of nonspecific inflammation of the liver, and these, uh, these mice get a cholangiocarcinoma that, kind of, that recapitulates and looks um, just like the human disease. And when we do that, we see the same sort of things that we got an upregulation in these, um, uh, these myelopoietic cytokines that are going to activate the bone marrow to release cells to the peripheral blood and ultimately to the tumor microenvironment. And when we look at this mouse, we see, it, we see the same uh, thing that if you look in the peripheral blood or the spleen, that you get an up uh, regulation or uh, increased prevalence of these um, neutrophils that are, come into the peripheral blood and ultimately make it to the tumor where they become tumor associated neutrophils and, and are, uh, are profoundly immune suppressive. So, um, and this is just the data showing uh, normal versus the, the uh, wild type versus the genetic spontaneous model. You've got an increase in inflammatory monocytes and an increase in the, in the um, um, granulocytes in the, in, the, in the bone marrow. In the peripheral blood, it's more marked. And when you look at the spleen, you see a marked increase in the, in the granulocytes in this model. Um, the ligands also go up, so these, uh, looking at the tumors, it's exactly the same as what I've showed you before in the mouse model of pancreas cancer and in the human tissue, that the tumor cells themselves are upregulating these ligands, uh, and you've got, you, which allows for the trafficking of these neutrophils into the tumor microenvironment. <coughs> and, um, and you can see here when you compare normal wild type to the, to the, uh, to the spontaneous model that there's a marked increase uh, in, the, in the tumor of these um, tumor-associated neutrophils that are immune suppressive. So in the cholangio model, the, the neutrophils may be a little bit more abundant than they are in pancreas, but it's the same story. And when you go back to human tissue and look at this, you can show the same thing, that there's prognostic significance to um, circulating monocytes in the peripheral blood um, of patients with cholangiocarcinoma. <coughs> so, um, so I showed you pancreas cancer and, and cholangio, and we were kind of interested in pancreas cancer for the most part because the, the, the immune infiltrate of pancreas cancer is different than other cancers. And I showed you there, you know, 80% of the cells are myeloid cells. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we thought this was important. We could show prognostic significance. But the question is, 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 it, is this relevant to other cancers? And every cancer we've looked at, um, there's prognostic significance to the to the monocytes in the, in the tumor microenvironment. So you can see this is in pancreas cancer, in ovarian cancer, in colorectal cancer, and in breast cancer. And so when you look at these other cancers, they don't have this predominant myelin infiltrate when you look at the tumors, but it still uh, is prognostically significant in resected uh, patients, which is one of the reasons why we think it's a really important target. So the next trial that we're embarking on now is this uh, dual inhibition with CCR2 and CXCR2, where we're going to ablate, we're going to uh, prevent any of these myeloid cells from getting into the tumor microenvironment, and it's going to be in the metastatic setting, and we're going to have core needle biopsies, both baseline and on treatment, and we're getting a little bit more sophisticated in terms of our immune monitoring of those uh, tumor biopsies. And this is just an example of, um, 
of Cytoff from uh, of human liver metastasis, where we now have, uh, you know, at the single cell level, uh, using Cytoff, which I'm, some of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Cytoff, but basically it's, um, it's using mass cytometry uh, instead of, um, of uh, spectral analysis to look at the single cell level at the, in, the immune cells infiltrating the tumor microenvironment. And we have a myeloid panel and a T cell panel where we can look simultaneously at 37 different parameters of the T cell, so not only phenotype and function, um, and we can collect a lot of really important data. And this is just what taking that single cell data, uh, which is a very complex data set, and turning it into a two-dimensional uh, in interpretation for a data analysis. But you can see uh, this, the, uh, all the CD45 cells, and you can see uh, which are the uh, CD4 cells. Uh, the CD8 cells are here. These are the CD4 cells here. And then you can really start to look at these CD, and the, you know, the size of the dot is the prevalence of the cells. And you can see we're, we can generate an enormous amount of data from these biopsies and then go back and correlate that with clinical response uh, to see uh, what are the, the cells in the microenvironment that are driving that clinical response. So it's just such a much more powerful tool uh, to do the immune monitoring from these biopsies that we'll obtain from the dual uh, inhibitor study with CCR2 and CXCR2. So I hope I've convinced you that we can manipulate the tumor microenvironment to, uh, to augment the effectiveness of chemotherapy. That's actually a really important question, too, because we've seen that we need, that in the, in the preclinical models anyway, the chemotherapy is kind of essential or the, the, to, to probably expose the antigen. You get tumor cell death, and it allows this adaptive immune response to take place. But then we're, I'm showing you evidence that we're turning on an adaptive immune response, and then we're giving this cytotoxic chemotherapy. And the question is, is it killing off your adaptive immune response? And so timing the chemotherapy with uh, the immune modulation is something that we don't know a lot about, and there's a lot of uh, a lot that we have to study about that. I think you can do these pure immuno-oncology trials, maybe in second-line pancreas, where you you know could give the um, the monocyte inhibitor with a checkpoint inhibitor, for example, without chemotherapy um, in second line. But it, there's not a lot of enthusiasm, at least with the medical oncologists I work with, foregoing chemotherapy and doing this pure. So we've got to figure out a way that the chemo and the immune therapy can work together. Um, the mechanism is at least in part immunologic. I think we've shown you that, that shown you a lot of data to suggest that, that we're reprogramming. If you look at the cytokines, if you look at the chemokine ligands or the chemokine receptors in the tumor microenvironment, if you look at um, you know, the mouse model showing, the, the NER77 mouse showing that you've got a uh, marked increase in um, TCR, uh, T cell receptor engagement and signaling in the myeloid depleted uh, animals. Um, and their understanding of the biology of the compensatory re response is important. We know that from the CCR2 trial that we get this increase in the, in the, the TANs, which are probably just as deleterious in the microenvironment. Uh, and so understanding those uh, compensatory responses that could be driving treatment resistance, and so that's one of the reasons why it's really important to collect this tissue and to, to study it. Um, and so I think... I'll show my last slide, and I show this slide every time I give a talk about pancreas cancer because this is our pancreas cancer survivors event, and there's so much nihilism about this disease out there, even among physicians, and uh, these are all patients that have participated in these clinical trials, and so, you know, it's, it's pretty pathetic when you look at it that I think at the last count, 5% of patients with pancreas cancer participate in clinical trials, uh, and it should be 95% in my opinion, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why we have to design these uh, novel trials for pancreas cancer patients to participate in, um, and we've got to dispel that nihilism because uh, these are all long-term survivors of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. These are these aren't neuroendocrine. We check their path at the door before we let them in, um, and so um, so I show that to kind of help dispel nihilism and to put that plug in is, is we need to enroll patients in trials and we need to collect baseline and on-treatment biopsies to understand mechanisms of treatment success and treatment failure. And then uh, the, the, those are the folks in uh, my lab that did all the work. Um, and then the uh, key collaborators, David Donardo at WashU, he and I are co-PIs on, uh, on the SPORE, the Washington University, University of Rochester SPORE grant uh, with a trial of uh, myeloid depletion plus checkpoint inhibition. And then Jen Jen Ye, who we are providing all of our genomic data, uh, which she then analyzes and uh, again, we think between the genomic analysis and the CYTOF analysis, we're really going to be able to tell with a very uh, high degree of accuracy 
um, what's happening in the microenvironment, have we reprogrammed it, is there an adaptive immune response happening, and, and if not, um, and, and if that doesn't, it correlates with prognosis, then it may be a big help to patients to decide who should stay on this or who should get this therapy in the first place. So I wanted to leave a little time for discussion and questions, so I think I will stop there. Yeah, I mean, we, when I started this, I actually thought that the regulatory T cells were the key, and we published papers uh, probably like eight or ten years ago uh, where we were focusing on um, CCR5 and CCL5 because you can show the same thing. Tumor cells express the ligands, CCR5 draws in the regulatory T cells, and we were able to show uh, this is all mouse work with, this, uh, uh, with um, inhibition of CCL5 that we could prevent regulatory T cells and there was an anti-tumor immune response associated with that. My, my gut feeling is, is that it's the innate cells, the myeloid cells that are kind of the orchestra conductor here. So if you, um, if in, the, in the regulatory T cells are sort of the downstream of that and if you, if you, if you get the innate cells, then the, the regulatory T cells aren't there. Um, and I think that the, there's so many different things and, and, you know, there's so many different other immune cells, but I think the, the, what happens to the, the macrophages really dictates um, the, the, the T cell infiltrate in the tumor. And so we've shown that repeatedly that by depleting the, the monocytes that the, the T regs go so away. Do you see CCR2 expression on the regulatory T cells in your cytop analysis? Um, you know, we actually, I'm not sure that we've really looked at that because we just really look at FOXB3 to, d to distinguish whether, whether or not they, um, they're there. We, we, do, we have done some work with a CCR2-5 inhibitor because there was a lot of CCR2-5 inhibitors that were developed because of HIV because that's the mechanism of viral entry into T cells. And so um, when we do that, uh, we see that th there's a direct hit on the, the T regs as well as the myeloid cells. The CCR2 kind of hits the myeloid cells. Uh, and the CCR5 hits the, um, hits the regulatory T cells. Uh, but we haven't seen that that's any better than CCR2 alone uh, when we compare the 2.5 to the... Um, so that's not really answering your question, but I think the, um, the, uh, the CCR2, if there's a direct effect, um, there could still be a direct effect, right? Because the CCR2 alone, it seems like it's better than the CCR2, better or equivalent or better than the CCR2-5. And we worried about the 5 too because activated C cells are going to express um, CCR5 as well. So it's, uh, it seems, to, in, in all the things that we've tried, it's like the direct hit on the myeloid seems to work best. But we haven't really looked at uh, ongoing CCR2. It's hard to even isolate regulatory T cells after you do the myeloid depletion. You could see from those studies. Be able to see it in CYTOF analysis. Yeah. You probably have CCR2 in the panel. Yeah, and, and CYTOF will be able to see a lot. And you know, the advantage of CYTOF too is, is that you're seeing these trends in the, the predominant cells, but you're also gonna identify some like rare, really rare populations of cells that you probably didn't even know about. So the CYTOF data will be really good to, to analyze that. Yeah. Texture, not just yeah. Yeah. The reason for asking that is you've shown a lot of this immune specific and specific immune infiltrate. So is this just a matter of modulating the stroma and allowing better blood flow rather than yeah. specific immune modulation? That's a good question, and that's uh, you probably reviewed one of my grants because some reviewer <laughs> said this has nothing to do with immunity. You're just you're just uh, <laughs> Um, it's, it's definitely true, and we, we knew this from the mouse model because you would, you'd get rid of the, the monocytes and the tumors were just like, they weren't these rock hard tumors like we were used to seeing. They were spongy tumors that were soft. And so it definitely 
by depleting the macrophages, you change the characteristics of the stroma. And you know, in pancreas cancer, a lot of people are thinking like that, right? The, the, the HA story uh, with the hyaluronic acid and stromal disruption as a strategy to get the chemo in. Um, and, and the skeptic would say, that's all, you know, you did this trial that showed a response rate, it's just because the, 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 the wonderfully effective chemo got in. I don't think that's the case, and I think that the human tissue that we collected really showed that we had changed uh, and allowed an adaptive immune response to take hold. But, you know, I, whatever, if it works, it works. If, if it is all uh, based on stromal disruption, that's good too. The, 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 you are, you're likely getting um, better penetration of the chemotherapy. Just And I can't tell you that scientific. We're actually looking at that. I've got a, somebody in biomedical engineering that can measure that with ultrasound, and we're, we're actually looking at that. Um, to see if we can be a little bit more scientific, scientific about it. But certainly in the animal model, there was a very, very significant uh, qualitative difference in the tumors after myeloid depletion. So it may be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you probably were another reviewer of one of our grants because that's a because oh, one of the criticisms we got when we first submitted this was well you're giving fulfirinox which is just such non-specific myeloid blood you're getting rid of everything, but we were able to show that when you know so the patient hits their nadir and then they repopulate and actually we were able to show from bone marrow biopsies that we had from a previous study that when they do repopulate after the nadir from chemotherapy there was actually a higher prevalence of the CCR2 positive monocyte so. So when you repopulate after the chemotherapy, um, you, there was a very high prevalence of these cells. And that was, we had to show that actually, the grant didn't get funded in the first go around because everyone said, you've got this wonderful target, but you're, it's not gonna be there because of all the nonspecific myeloblation from very aggressive systemic chemotherapy. But the, you know, the reason, the CCR2 inhibitors, it's, it, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the mechanism of action is in different places. For the CCR2 inhibition, that's happening at the bone marrow. We're not, those, those cells aren't getting out of the bone marrow. So we can show that it goes down in the peripheral blood and you're blocking the mobilization from the bone marrow. The CXCR2 inhibitor is different. There's no change in the peripheral blood um, um, granulocytes, but they're blocked from the tumor. So it's the trafficking from the peripheral blood into the tumor that's blocked. So, um, so they're just a little bit more sophisticated targeting mechanisms than chemo, be it 5-FU or anything where you're gonna have a lot of nonspecific myeloblation, uh, but the, the important thing is, is when those cells repopulate, what do they look like? And, um, and, and the mechanism is really different. So uh, we were kind of surprised. We expected with the CXCR2, we were gonna see uh, them pile up in the bone marrow, not be in the peripheral blood. We saw just the opposite. They were, they, were being, they were being mobilized, but they were never trafficking into the tumor microenvironment. We worried about that with the CCR2 because you, we could see in the bone marrow, and we, in, the, in that study, we not only got tumor biopsies, we got pre and post bone marrow biopsies and peripheral blood. So uh, we really, we, we studied that. And we had concerns that when we stopped the CCR2 inhibitor, we know that these cells are deleterious, they're gonna get there, they're gonna be immune suppressive. We saw that they were kind of piling up in the bone marrow, and we feared that when we stopped the inhibitor, you were gonna get this big <laughs> flood. And there was actually a paper published in a breast cancer model that showed it actually accelerated metastasis when you stopped it. So we worried about that in the trial. We didn't see it. Um, with a small molecule inhibitor. In the breast story, it was a monoclonal, but, um, but it's, these are just more uh, direct targets, I think, than, than chemo. But it certainly was a criticism, like you're, you've got this great drug, but the target's gone from the chemo. Yeah. So when you study the uh, combination strategy in animal models, do you see a difference in effect in the metastatic site with the primary site, or is it somewhat homogenous? Well, um, so all that work that I showed you was in the metastatic mouse model. So um, the, you know, one of the questions that a lot of people ask is, is like the stromal different in a primary versus a met? And it's, it, it's actually not that different. I thought it would be because I thought a lot of the desmoplasia was specific to the pancreas. But when you look in the metastasis, you find uh, very similar um, prevalences of different immune cells that you see in the, in the primary tumor. So uh, it's not, they tend not to be quite as, um, as desmoplastic. The tumors aren't quite as hard and firm in the mouse model in the METS, but when you analyze the immune infiltrate, they look pretty similar. So, and again, it's like, you know, in, 
what, some of the, what I tried to show you, it's actually the tumor cells themselves that are expressing all these ligands that are drawing these cells in, and that's pretty consistent whether you look at the primary or the MAC. Right, maybe last question. Yeah, so it's probably those CXCL ligands that I showed you. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're up. They definitely go up. We haven't really shown that they're increased. They go up. There's an increase when you do the CCR2 inhibition. We've, we've been able to show that when you look at the cells in the microenvironment, they're there. What exactly the mechanism of that is a little unclear. Is it just that, you know, you've got to, uh, they're competing for space, and if the, if the, if the TAMs don't get there, the TANs will. Um, uh, we could look at that, if, but they're, they're so high, the CXCL ligands are so high, kind of even at baseline in the tumor, that uh, it'd be like showing subtle differences in the, the concentration or of, the, of the ligands, I think, would be difficult. They're, they're the signals there. Why, um, you know, it's sort of, if you look at it at baseline, it's kind of almost 50-50, maybe a little more neutrophils and granule sites, but when you get rid of one, the other fills, this, fills the void. I don't really, under, I don't know the mechanism. so we can stay on time and thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.